Good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to start by thanking uh, Dr. McCarthy for extending an invitation to me to um, give this Grand Rounds presentation today. So uh, for those who are familiar with my research, it should come as no surprise that I'll be talking about mass spectrometry and proteomics this morning. Um, but I hope to kind of give a glimpse of um, a couple of the projects that are going on in the lab, but I'll spend the majority of the time talking about targeted mass spectrometry. So to begin, I do not have any relevant disclosures. Um, here are the learning objectives for this morning. So um, again, by the end of the presentation, um, attendees uh, should be able to explain the need for standardized assays to measure human proteins in the context of precision medicine. Um, also hope to be able to evaluate the role of mass spec applications in the three main phases of biomarker development, and also hope to be able to understand the fundamental aspects of the development and validation of targeted mass spec assays for the quantitative measurement of proteins. So to accomplish all this, um, my talk will be divided into three main sections. Um, first, I'll talk about proteins as diagnostic biomarkers. Um, so I always feel like I have to justify our need for, fo for focusing um, our research on proteins. Um, secondly, um, I'll talk about a couple of the projects in the lab that are being conducted by um, graduate students who are conducting a proteomic analysis of targeted drug treatment sensitivity and high-grade serous ovarian cancer. And uh, the last part of the talk will be focused on developing and validating a multiplex targeted mass spec assay to quantify candidate ovarian cancer serum protein biomarkers. So launching right into proteins as diagnostic biomarkers. So why do we need to study proteins? So um, first, it's very notable that gene levels um, do not predict protein levels. So on the left here is a figure from um, a publication from a study that I was involved in, where we looked at um, over 100 um, high-grade serous ovarian uh, carcinomas, and uh, we conducted a thorough proteomic analysis, and the um, transcriptomic analysis of these tumors um, had also been performed. So the main take-home message here is the median correlation between the gene abundance, abundance and the protein abundance is only 0.45. So some may say, actually, that's a great correlation. Uh, some may say that's a poor correlation, but I think it's fair to say that um, just by focusing on the protein level or the genome uh, level alone uh, does not give us a full, um, full picture of what's actually happening in our biological specimens. This is a figure from an independent study, and they basically show the same thing. Uh, the median correlation between uh, the gene and the protein level is um, less than 0.5. And switching over to um, another um, biological system, so looking at uh, clear cell renal cell carcinoma tumor tissue, um, same thing was found here. So looking at the mRNA protein correlation, median correlation here is 0.43, and then even when you look at normal adjacent uh, tissue, uh, the median correlation is 0.34. So, um, so I think that really states the case for um, why, it, why it's important to not ignore um, proteins when we're conducting our thorough um, analysis of these specimens. So let's see where we are in terms of protein biomarker statistics. So um, just in the scientific literature for just for cancer alone, there are over 1,000 biomarker candidates, and I do want to emphasize this word candidates. Um, but if we look at why a lot of these candidates have not made it through the pipeline to the um, end stage of a validated biomarker, uh, we find that a lot of these biomarker candidates uh, lack sensitivity and specificity uh, when we get to the point of assessing a clinical diagnosis. Um, the greatest success for these biomarker candidates that have gone on to be fully validated biomarkers has been for the detection of advanced stage cancers where the survival rate is already low. So, um, again, this underscores um, the need to kind of focus more effort um, in the early stage, uh, early stage cancer detection. And also the majority of candidate biomarkers have really haven't progressed from the lab to the clinic because they have actually stopped at the first phase of biomarker discovery. And there are several reasons for that. So to kind of hammer home this point a little bit more, um, this figure, it's a little bit dated, but um, the data really hasn't changed. So this is looking at, so the year of FDA clearance or approval uh, for several different uh, proteins. So um, starting with uh, troponin T back in 1994, and we have troponin I, um, IGF-2. Um, here are some of your cancer biomarkers um, coming up in like 1998. And um, here's HE4, one of the um, ovarian cancer protein biomarkers um, in 2008. So um, the main take home point from this figure is 
um, the average rates of FDA approval of these protein biomarkers, it's been about one uh, per year. So if you look at um, just a snapshot of the FDA approved protein tumor markers, um, the protein tumor markers for ovarian cancer are highlighted in teal. So of course we have CA125, um, that received um, FDA approval um, in 1997. Um, then we have HE4, another ovarian cancer protein biomarker receiving FDA approval in 2008. And then ROMA, so a, um, a multi-index uh, multi uh, diagnostic uh, biomarker that was cleared in uh, 2011. So again, um, um, the rate at which uh, the FDA is approving these uh, protein biomarkers, again, it's about, about one per year. But there's a lot of opportunities here for um, additional biomarkers. So again, uh, so proteins uh, carry out the biological functions of cells and they form the bi uh, basis of diagnostic tests and treatments. But very importantly, um, more than 95% of human proteins cannot be studied uh, reliably due to a lack of reliable and standardized assays for quantifying their abundance. So it therefore follows that standardizing tools uh, for quantifying human proteins um, really does have the ability to fundamentally transform uh, biomedical research. And the impact of this will be um, improved patient diagnosis and treatments um, for the purpose of facilitating precision medicine. So again, just making the case here that it's really important to study proteins and um, it's even more important to study them well. And by studying, studying them well, meaning that we need to have reliable and standardized assays. So speaking of uh, biomarker discovery and development, so what are the phases of this biomarker discovery um, or development uh, pipeline? So what does this look like? So the first phase is what we're terming um, a preclinical or an exploratory phase. So oftentimes these studies are done in, um, in vitro models or perhaps um, a patient-derived uh, xenograft model. Um, and here the goal is to detect candidate biomarkers. So here we can um, detect upwards of 100 to uh, maybe thousands of biomarker candidates. But then as you go along uh, further along this biomarker development pipeline, um, your test population changes and your aims change. And also the number of biomarker candidates um, should decrease. Um, I do want to point out that of course, uh, with each point um, at, at each step in this biomarker development pipeline, um, there are significant costs involved, um, costs um, financial and also time. So it really is um, really important to really uh, to design these studies uh, very, very uh, carefully. So um, my favorite analytical tool of choice is mass spectrometry. And mass spec is a great tool to study proteins. So um, what is mass spec? So mass spec is basically a method that enables us to weigh molecules uh, based on their mass to charge ratio. Um, three main components of a mass spec, these come in all different flavors. Um, you have an ion source, a mass analyzer, and a detector. So throughout this talk, I will um, make repeated references to what I'm terming as a uh, mass spec uh, toolkit. Um, so there are three main applications um, that, um, that I will be speaking about. So discovery applications, targeted, and then um, actually I will not be talking about semi-targeted in this talk, but uh, so primarily discovery and targeted. Um, without going into all of these details, um, each one of these applications has their specific methods. There's a specific type of mass spec that's usually dedicated to these type of applications. Uh, the quantification methods are different, throughput differs, and then of course, as with any analytical technique, um, each one of these methods has its strengths and also limitations. So when we think about analytical methods, um, it's nice to kind of think about them um, in a historical context or to kind of think about them um, on, a, um, on a continuum. So, um, so any analytical method um, certainly exists within a certain life cycle. So we can look at these methods as being in an exploratory phase, being emerging, established, expiring, or extinct. So of course, um, we do not want to be down here in the expiring or extinct phase. And then of course, there are also pros and cons to being early adopters of technology. So being down here in this area of the curve where um, these um, analytical methods are considered to be exploratory. And overall usefulness um, can be um, plotted here on the, um, the y-axis. 
So it's, it's kind of funny when I started using this um, figure um, several years ago, um, I would say that mass spec was still kind of considered, um, at least from a clinical context, kind of like an emerging technology. So um, mass spec was considered, was at that time considered by many to be um, kind of an emerging analytical method. And there would have been several years before it was routinely implemented in the clinical lab. But things have certainly changed over the years. And I would say that mass spec is certainly now a very much so established analytical method. Um, it's ready for expanded clinical implementation. Uh, there's still certainly some limitations there, but I think it's exciting that there are a lot of opportunities where mass spec can be used to answer a lot of our um, pressing uh, biological questions and also a lot of opportunities to implement uh, mass spec in the clinical lab. So uh, mass spec is currently um, used in the clinical lab um, in several different areas. So endocrinology for the measurement of vitamin D, thyroglobulin, and several steroid hormones. Um, it's also used in the context of therapeutic drug monitoring and toxicology um, for pain management, um, quantifying uh, you know, immunosuppressants, and it's also used for precision oncology. Um, it's used in the microbiology lab for microorganism identification. Um, metabolomics, um, it's used for newborn screening and detection of inborn errors of metabolism. And I think there's also a lot of opportunities for expanded use of mass spec in the clinical lab. So why aren't we there yet? And there meaning um, the expanded um, applications of mass spec in the clinical lab. So there are certainly um, several challenges. Um, so setting up a new mass spec system um, requires a significant capital um, expense. Um, there's also a high level of technical proficiency that's required by the lab staff uh, to achieve minimum assay downtime that results from assay failure. Um, in general, um, mass spec uh, throughput is a little bit low, although that is changing, that is changing. Um, but importantly, not all analytes are readily detectable by mass spec. Um, there's limited assay standardization, although again, that's changing. And um, the upshot of all this is really to, um, to realize the benefits of mass spec um, it really depends on the needs of the population that's being served by the laboratory and the number and type of analytes that need to be measured. So um, that wraps up the first section. So we've talked about um, proteins as, as diagnostic biomarkers. We've talked about a few opportunities for mass spec. So now we'll um, kind of take a little bit of a detour. And I do want to highlight a couple of the um, more discovery-based um, projects, uh, mass spec-based projects that are going on in my lab. So we'll talk uh, a little bit about the proteomic analysis of targeted drug treatment sensitivity in high-grade serous ovarian cancer. So again, we're kind of taking a little bit of a detour here, but still, um, still following the themes of uh, proteins and mass spec. So here is this mass spec toolkit again. And the next couple of projects that I will talk about um, are um, in this bucket of discovery applications. So um, one would want to um, employ a discovery-based mass spec approach when you have your samples and you just want to figure out what are the proteins that are present in your samples? What are their relative um, abundances? So the main type of uh, mass spec data acquisition method that we're using is called data dependent acquisition. Uh, the throughput is not super great, but um, the real strength here is it enables you to gain a deep analytical coverage of your samples. So um, we are studying um, ovarian cancer, and just to review some of the um, ovarian cancer statistics. Um, so it's the number one cause of gynecologic cancer deaths, um, the number five cause of cancer-related death in women, and the 11th most common cancer um, in women. And um, about one in 75 women will develop ovarian cancer in her lifetime. So of course, uh, mutations in uh, uh, BRCA1 and 2 genes are indicators of faulty DNA repair mechanisms, and germline mutations in these genes are found in up to a quarter of patients that have high-grade serous ovarian cancer. So not only do these, um, these um, mutations in BRCA1 and 2 confer um, a genomic instability and also malignant uh, and a propensity for malignant transformation, um, these defects um, also confer sensitivity to DNA-damaging agents and also um, effective uh, chemo or radiation therapy. So this has really underlined um, the development of a set of targeted uh, drugs for um, ovarian cancer known as PARP inhibitors. Um, how do these PARP inhibitors work? So they're really, their mechanism of action is um, to, um, to impair um, DNA damage uh, repair. 
So what really happens here? So there are several different um, agents that can cause DNA damage. So um, several different types of stress or reactive oxygen species. Um, when DNA damage occurs within cells with um, a normal functioning DNA repair pathway, PARP is one of the enzymes that's recruited to the site of DNA damage. Um, there are um, several different uh, proteins that then become uh, parlated, uh, parlation being a post-translation modification. The upshot of all this is that DNA becomes repaired and then the cells are viable. But however, in the context of cancer and malignant transformation, um, you the goal is to, um, to eliminate um, your uh, malignant cells. So you do not want these cells to be viable. So with the um, introduction of PARP inhibitors, um, these PARP inhibitors will inhibit the function of this PARP enzyme, thereby preventing DNA damage to be repaired. And this will lead to cell death, or the death of the um, cancer cells. So what are the recommendations for the use of PARP inhibitors? Um, so here are uh, three of the um, approved PARP inhibitors in the context of ovarian cancer. So olaparib, niraparib, and uh, rucaparib. So um, these PARP inhibitors are recommended for use um, either as maintenance therapy um, after a patient has um, undergone first remission or second or greater remission. Uh, these PARP inhibitors are used in the context of uh, maintenance uh, therapy. So um, I talked a little bit about so BRCA mutations. Um, I didn't talk a lot about homologous recombination deficiency, but suffice it to say, initially um, these PARP inhibitors were developed for patients who have mutations in BRCA genes and who also have a homologous recombination deficiency. So um, a deficiency in one of the DNA repair pathways. However, what's highlighted in red is that it's found it was had been found. Um, that these PARP inhibitors are also effective in patients who have um, normal functioning homologous repair pathways. So this kind of um, opened up a lot of questions. So initially, again, so patients with homologous recombination deficient tumors benefit from the use of PARP inhibitors. But the complication here is that the majority of tumors ultimately develop acquired resistance to PARP inhibitors. And BRCA1 and 2 mutations are commonly used as markers of PARP inhibitor sensitivity in clinical practice, but not all patients with BRCA1 and 2 mutations have PARP inhibitor sensitive disease. So really this kind of creates a question of what are the underlying determinants of sensitivity to treatments with these PARP inhibitors? So um, it has to be something that's more than these BRCA1 and 2 mutations, because again, um, patients who have uh, mutations in these BRCA genes uh, are sensitive to these PARP inhibitors, but then patients who do not have mutations in these BRCA genes um, are also sensitive to treatment with PARP inhibitors. So um, we in the lab are taking a, an approach, a protein-based approach to kind of tease out the mechanisms that underlie and confer sensitivity to treatment with these PARP inhibitors. So to do this, um, we're taking a mass spec-based approach. Um, so initially, um, a lot of our studies have been um, based on using in vitro um, cell culture models of several different uh, types of um, ovarian cancer cell lines. So basically we have our cell lines that are treated with different PARP inhibitors. Um, these uh, so the proteins are then extracted from the cells, uh, proteins are then digested and then chemically labeled, uh, stable um, isotope labeled um, chemicals. Um, this enables us to multiplex our samples. Uh, these samples are then um, separated um, offline and then analyze via mass spectrometry. And this enables us to quantify um, between 6,000 and 8,000 proteins. And again, this falls in the kind of discovery application of a targeted mass spectrometry. So this is the work uh, primarily of one of my graduate students in the lab, Jacinia Perez. So she's looking at the proteomic determinants of PARP inhibitor resistance um, in high-grade serous ovarian cancer. So she's using the uh, basic workflow that I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, and her work was published um, in uh, the end of 2021. But um, essentially, so we're looking at proteins um, whose relative abundances differ um, upon treatment with um, these different PARP inhibitors. Um, she's also looking at differences in um, endogenous levels of PARP activity um, in various um, ovarian cancer cell lines and how a PARP activity changes in response to treatment with various PARP inhibitors. Her um, current ongoing studies are uh, focused on um, really developing proteogenomic. So again, this is merging the protein-based analysis and the genomic analysis, so proteogenomic 
um, insights into the mechanisms of acquired PARP inhibitor resistance formation. So um, as I mentioned earlier, so um, patients who are treated with PARP inhibitors, uh, the majority of them after they um, do exhibit a response, uh, they eventually develop a resistance. So for Jacinthia's project, um, she is developing a resistance, a PARP inhibitor resistance ovarian cancer cell lines. And um, throughout the development of resistance, um, she's looking at how the proteogenomic profiles of these cells change um, with the goal, again, of identifying um, hallmarks of um, changes in the protein landscape and also in the, in the transcriptomic landscape um, that correlate with the development of um, acquired resistance to treatment with PARP inhibitors. So switching gears a little bit, but still uh, focusing on uh, targeted therapies in the context of um, ovarian cancer. So instead of looking at uh, PARP inhibitors, so this project is focusing on looking at um, histone deacetylase inhibitors or HDAC inhibitors. So histone deacetylases or HDACs um, have roles in DNA replication and repair, um, cell cycle regulation, apoptosis, and also metastasis. Um, changes in the regulation of these, of these HDACs um, can cause changes in the protein acetylation landscape, and they also contribute to tumor genesis uh, by decreasing the expression of tumor suppressor genes and also facilitating DNA damage repair. So although um, these HDAC inhibitors um, are successful as combination therapeutics, um, the mechanism of their antineoplastic activity has not really been fully characterized. So let's take a little bit of a deeper dive into what happens um, in the context of protein acetylation and cancer. So this is a, um, a very nice um, figure that kind of lays out um, the, um, the perturbations and histone deacetylate mediated regulation of protein acetylation in cancer cells. So if you look at what happens in a normal cell, there's pretty much a good equilibrium between acetylation and deacetylation. So acetylation mediated by histone acetyltransferase, uh, acetyltransferases, and then uh, deacetylation, which is mediated by your HDACs or your histone deacetylases. But um, what happens within um, cancer cells is you have um, um, an, an, a disequilibrium. So there's a, an imbalance between the activities of your HATs and your HDACs. So um, with your HDACs having um, a higher activity, hence the rationale for the incorporation of HDAC inhibitors in um, various cancer uh, therapies. So here again, um, the upshot of increased HDAC activity is you would have higher degrees of deacetylation and lower levels of acetylation. So um, these are a couple of figures from the study that I published um, a few years ago, but basically uh, this is showing in the context of high-grade serous ovarian carcinoma, um, basically showing um, decreased levels of um, histone acetylation and tumors that are homologous recombination deficient uh, versus those that are um, uh, homologous recombination proficient or non-homologous recombination deficient. So again, just um, showing um, this uh, phenomenon of decreased levels of acetylation um, in a context of um, high-grade uh, serous ovarian carcinomas that are homologous recombination deficient. So um, there have been several studies that have, um, have shown this similar trend. So HDAC6 is one of the HDACs and it's of regulation uh, has been shown to correlate with poor prognosis in ovarian cancer. So these two survival plots are looking at uh, progression-free survival and overall survival. And um, these are from patients who have um, high levels of HDAC expression versus low levels of HDAC expression. And across these two measures, we see that the patients that have um, higher expression of HDAC6 have a poor, um, poor prognosis and uh, worse uh, survival. So in the context of what we're doing in the lab uh, currently, um, this is the work of Jolene Duda, so one of the graduate students in the lab. Um, this is one of her publications that came out a couple of months ago, um, but she is looking at a differential histone deacetylase inhibitor, so HDAC inhibitor, induced perturbations of the global proteome landscape in the setting of high-grade serous ovarian cancer. So in, um, this figure here is just showing um, differences in HDAC activity in response to treatment with various HDAC inhibitors, across various um, um, high-grade serous ovarian cancer cell lines. So uh, some of these HDAC inhibitors are uh, broad-spectrum inhibitors. Some of them are more targeted. But um, again, the, really the focus of what we're trying to do here is to tease out um, the, um, the functional mechanisms of these HDAC inhibitors. And we're also trying to identify some of their um, off-target effects. 
And in the context of um, ovarian cancer treatment and therapies, um, there are a couple of um, ongoing clinical trials uh, that are using HDAC inhibitors as uh, sensitizing agents um, prior to treatment with um, PARP inhibitors. So um, HDAC inhibitors um, have been shown to sensitize homologous recombination proficient ovarian cancer cells to, uh, to PARP inhibitors. So that's something that we are looking to, um, to work on, uh, not only in in vitro cancer, um, in vitro cell line model, but also in um, a patient-derived uh, xenograft model um, using um, patient-derived xenograft um, tumor tissue that we have acquired through a collaboration that we have with um, a couple of investigators at the Mayo Clinic. Okay, so I feel like that was a lot. Um, I do want to take a quick breath here, take a breather. Um, here's a little bit of trivia. So um, I'm not originally from uh, Minnesota, so I'm still getting accustomed to all the phenomenal uh, diversity of wildlife that occurs around here. So um, last uh, last winter, um, I noticed these tracks in the snow in our backyard. This completely befuddled me, but apparently <laughs> I'm among the um, the small percentage of people who did not know what type of animal made these tracks. But does anybody want to care to give a guess in terms of what animal made these tracks? Deer. I'm sorry, what was that? Deer. A deer, okay, do we have any other guesses? Rabbit. 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 Bunny. <clears throat> oh, okay, yep, yes, or, yes, it's hair or rabbits. So, yes. so, so like these smaller footprints here are the, are the rabbits' um, four legs and then these um, the longer footprints are the, uh, the rabbit's hind legs. But yeah, this completely befuddled me when I saw these tracks. But anyways, okay. So, so we're taking a break and oh, I feel like that was a lot. So we're going to switch gears to the final section here. So now we'll talk about, so developing and validating a multiplex targeted mass spec assay to quantify candidate ovarian cancer serum protein biomarkers. So going back to our mass spec toolkit, so now we're going to be um, focusing on this middle area. So targeted mass spec assays. So targeted applications are um, applicable when you know what you want to measure. So now you just want to measure this um, defined set of analytes across a large panel of samples. So the methods that are typically used here are terms multiple reaction monitoring or MRM, sometimes called selective reaction monitoring. Um, also, um, there's another similar form of uh, targeted mass spec terms, parallel reaction monitoring. Um, there are dedicated types of mass specs here. Um, the throughput is much, much higher than that of your discovery-based uh, applications. Um, the, one of the major strengths of these targeted applications is that they can be extensively multiplexed. So you can quantify um, several different analytes within a given run. Um, these targeted applications have a high level of sensitivity, specificity, accuracy, and reproducibility. Um, but of course, as with any analytical method, there are certain limitations. Um, we do need an internal standard for each analyte. And um, developing these assays and validating these assays does require a considerable amount of resources. So um, here is kind of a schematic of what um, I mean when I refer to targeted mass spec assays. So, um, here is a schematic of so protein biomarker validation using these assays. So what are we talking about here? So you would have your um, patient samples, and actually don't have to be patient samples, but um, so your biological samples of interest, extract your proteins, digest your proteins into peptides. Um, this is an optional step where you can fractionate your peptides. Um, you would analyze your peptides via mass spectrometry. What you are looking at in your mass spectrometer will then be what are called extracted ion chromatograms. So you're basically looking at the intensity of all of these peptides that you're monitoring. Then um, ultimately, you will be able to look at the relative abundances of these peptides or biomarkers to evaluate their um, statistical significance in relation to the different clinical states that are being analyzed. The main strength of these targeted uh, mass spec assays is that, again, they enable the detection and um, the quantitation of specific predetermined analytes. And that's the key here is that your analytes need to be predetermined. So you already know what you're looking for. Now the name of the game is to reliably quantify them across a large panel of samples. Um, these assays can be extensively multiplexed with high sensitivity, specificity, accuracy, and reducibility. So again, going into a little bit more detail about these targeted mass spec based assays. 
So um, back in 20, um, I think it was actually 2013 when this meeting occurred, there are representatives from um, academia, government, and industry that got together to, um, to assign um, kind of a framework around these assays. So um, when we say targeted mass spec based assays, what do we really mean? Um, are these research grade assays? Are these assays that are ready to be deployed in the clinical context? So this um, group came, um, they established a um, three tiered uh, fit for purpose um, approach for these assays. So tier three assays are considered to be your investigational assays. Tier two assays, the goal here is to identify your good biomarker candidates. And tier one assays, these assays are the assays that are ready to be submitted for FDA approval. And again, the goal here is to really assign a framework around these mass spec based assays to help facilitate um, their um, translation into um, the clinic. So going into a little bit more detail about these three tiered assays. So let's start down here at the bottom. So down here at the bottom, so your tier three investigational assays. So what do we mean here? So let's look at um, so the degree of analytical validation. So we're talking about a low level of analytical validation. Um, you, there's not even a requirement for the inclusion of labeled internal standards for these tier three assays, no reference standards, um, specificity is moderate to high, precision low to moderate. Um, these assays do not need to be quantitatively accurate. Um, the repeatability can be moderate or high. Um, and then again here, the results require fuller, uh, further verification using quantitative techniques. Then when we step up to your tier two assays, these assays are being used to identify good biomarker candidates. And these are considered like your research grade assays. Um, here you'll be looking at between like tens and hundreds of analytes. And again, analytes being like peptides or proteins. The degree of analytical validation is higher than that of your tier three assays. These assays do require internal standards for every analyte. Um, reference standards have limited use here, but these assays have a high degree of specificity, um, moderate to high precision. Um, these assays do not necessarily need to be quantitatively accurate, so you can certainly use um, crude peptides to develop these assays. Um, they do have a high degree of repeatability, and um, importantly, you would need to, um, to, uh, to address the precision and the relative um, the relative quantitative accuracy of these assays. And then tier one assays. So these are your assays that would be ready to go to submit to the FDA for, um, for, um, for approval. And these would be assays that would be considered your clinical bioanalysis or diagnostic laboratory tests. The degree of analytical validation, no surprise here is high. You would absolutely need um, labeled internal standards for every single analyte. You would absolutely need reference standards high degree of specificity, high degree of precision. Um, and the goal here is to really define accuracy, high degree of repeatability. And again, um, you may need to comply with FDA or uh, CLIA guidance um, depending on the use of the assay. So again, here um, we talked about proteins and mass spec and then why a lot of these um, mass spec based proteins have uh, protein assays have not made their way into the clinic. It's because we have not had um, a good framework um, to uh, for how to develop or how to validate these assays. And then frankly, the technology has been in more of the development phase uh, for the last, um, I would say maybe decade or a couple of decades. And I think now we've kind of reached this exciting time where we are able to um, translate some of the framework that are used for traditional clinical assays onto these uh, mass spec based assays. So very exciting. So how do we do this? So how do we develop these targeted mass spec based assays? So there's kind of a prescriptive framework that we would follow. So the first, um, as of course with any experiment, so you need to generate a hypothesis. Um, so figure out what proteins you want to um, develop targeted assays for. So this would be a good opportunity to survey the literature to identify uh, certain biomarker candidates. Uh, this would be a good opportunity to um, to review the data that one might have from their discovery day studies to find out what may be kind of good candidates or good hits to pursue for further analysis. Then you want to define your, uh, design your study. Um, and none of these steps are, are, tri are trivial. There's um, certainly a lot that goes into each one of these steps, but again, they do follow this kind of prescriptive workflow. Um, you'd want to prepare your synthetic peptides. Um, there's a lot that goes into this as well. So whether you're using crude peptides, um, purified peptides or different levels of purification, 
Um, you want to develop and refine your method. Um, this is often a very iterative process. And then of course, all this ends with um, acquiring and analyzing your data. So again, um, it's really exciting times that we're having the, um, the development of more standards and guidance to help us um, move these uh, mastic-based uh, protein assays into the clinic. Um, so there are several resources in the form of, forms of uh, publications um, that exist to um, provide, again, a framework for how to develop these um, assays. So I mentioned that, um, so none of these steps are trivial, and even um, certain steps um, in terms of how you handle your um, peptide standard to these assays, there's a lot, like, a lot of considerations that go into um, those steps. So this is one publication that came out a few years ago, um, it details on um, how you select your peptides, um, important information that you need to obtain from commercial labs of regarding how your peptide standards are quantified, um, how they conduct their amino acid analysis, um, even um, details down to the type of material in which you would store your peptides prior to analysis, and then also evaluate how do you evaluate the effect of free stall. So these protein-based um, mass spec assays are, um, they're very complex, much more so complex than your um, small molecule assays. So um, there are just a whole host of variables that need to be not only considered, but you need to assess um, the variability, um, overall variability in the assay that's being contributed by these individual factors. And um, also along the lines of providing standards and guidance for developing these targeted assays um, was the publication of CLSI C64 guidance document. Um, this is the quantitative measurement of proteins and peptides by mass spec. Um, and um, um, Jesse Siegmiller in our department and I were both part of the um, document uh, development committee for this CLSI document. And again, um, super exciting that um, the community um, now has um, guidance for how to develop these uh, targeted mass spec assays to enable us to quantify proteins and peptides to help move some of these proteins and um, peptides from the status of biomarker candidates to being fully validated uh, biomarkers um, that are being used for clinical diagnostics. Okay, so um, what are we doing with these targeted mass spec assays in the lab? So this is a project um, that was funded by an innovation initiatives grant uh, from um, the Department of Lab Medicine and Pathology. Um, the co-investigator is um, Amy Skubitz from our department. And the goal here is to develop and validate uh, multiplexed tier two targeted mass spec assays to enable the quantification of 25 serum protein ovarian cancer biomarker candidates. So this uh, project was uh, primarily um, led by um, a um, staff scientist in my group, uh, Dr. Juhyun Ru, um, but it has since been um, translated um, actually over, over to me um, because um, Juhyun has had uh, several um, uh, medical complications, but um, he has um, really established a framework, an excellent framework for this project. And um, I've been able to carry on his work um, in addition to uh, one other person in the lab. So. Um, Tremendous thanks and kudos um, to him for really laying the groundwork. And that's him, and these are his kids, and that's his wife. Okay, so um, I talked about there are several, um, how there are several different considerations when we are developing these assays. So um, even in terms of how we are going to prepare our samples. So in our workflow, um, I mentioned that, um, so we're looking at um, ultimately peptides, but how do you derive your peptides from, in this case, serum? So you need to extract your proteins from the serum sample and you need to digest your proteins. So that's, again, that's certainly not trivial. So um, we've evaluated a couple of different protein digestion methods. We've looked at um, surfactant-aided digestion using this product uh, termed Rapigest. And we are also evaluating um, standardized commercial reagents for protein denaturation, um, alkylation, and digestion. Again, um, the goal here being um, the, um, the extent to which you can minimize variability due to sample preparation, um, that will just build well for your ultimate um, assay performance. Because again, um, at the end of the day, as with any um, assay method, um, you want to make sure that you are assessing uh, bi uh, biologic, true biological variability, and that is um, above the level of your technical variability. So anything that we can do to minimize our technical variability is certainly very advantageous. And since we're looking at serum, um, this is a very important consideration um, is to deplete or not to deplete. So 12 proteins of the couple of thousand proteins in the serum 
comprise 95% of the mass of all proteins in, serums, in human serum. So this is a considerable challenge for several different analytical methods, and mass spec being no exception. Um, mass spec is certainly biased to, um, to select the most abundant um, ions or peptides or small molecules in a given sample. So um, that's certainly something to take into consideration here, um, given that we are analyzing proteins derived from the serum. And also, so I focused on, so mass spec, mass spec, mass spec, but we certainly cannot ignore what happens um, immediately prior to the mass spectrometer, which is some sort of separation. So the type of separation that we're using here is liquid chromatography. And there are several different types of liquid chromatography. Um, so I'll just talk about two types. So nanoflow versus microflow. So they differ um, in terms of the order of magnitude um, with which your um, solvent is being delivered to separate your peptides prior to their analysis um, via mass spectrometry. So looking a little bit at our serum proteome sample preparation workflow. So this is work done by uh, Carly Twig, um, a uh, staff scientist in the lab. So as I mentioned, um, for our serum um, digestion and serum preparation to extract our proteins, uh, we are evaluating um, with two methods. So one is a surfactant-based method uh, termed RapiGest. Um, another is a commercial, um, commercial kit. And here the goal would be to um, just use standardized reagents to minimize the variability that's coming from our protein digestion. So um, she did that design an experiment just using one human serum sample divided into several aliquots. Um, these aliquots were um, subjected to um, technical replicates for the protein extraction and digestion process, um, three technical replicates for our mass spec analysis, and then uh, we looked at several different uh, metrics to assess the performances of these different um, workflows. So here, just looking at a very, very limited subset of proteins, just 97 proteins, and looking at their differences in relative abundance uh, between the proteins um, that were extracted from the serum prepared using this RapiGest, the surfactant, versus the commercial reagents. So overall, um, using the surfactant um, aided digestion, we're able to um, quantify proteins with a higher abundance. But with using this commercial reagents, we are able to um, quantify these same proteins, but with a wider range of abundance. So pros and cons for each, but um, very notably, and I think this is really a testament to, um, um, to Carly's experimental techniques, is that the CVs that were obtained from using um, these uh, standardized reagents versus using this um, surfactant-aided digestion, these CVs were very, very similar. So, um, so for now, we're proceeding with this surfactant-aided digestion method, um, one, because it's cheaper. <laughs> these commercial reagents are not cheap, they're very expensive, um, but it's, um, it's very um, it's informative to be able to, um, to evaluate um, these commercial um, reagents. So I talked about um, depletion and the challenge of um, upwards of 12 proteins accounting for more than 95% of the mass of the proteins that are present in serum. So if our goal is to quantify serum proteins, we certainly need to be aware of this complicating factor. One way that, um, that this, um, this complicated factor is um, addressed is by conducting immunodepletion. So by passing your serum through an amino affinity column that has antibodies that are directed against these um, highly abundant proteins. So the goal here would be to deplete those highly abundant proteins, and then that should enable you to have uh, more, um, a better chance of identifying and quantifying the proteins that are present at a lesser abundance. So what we're looking here, uh, we're looking at here in this uh, table um, is essentially the relative abundance of several different proteins that should be depleted by this amino affinity depletion column that we used. And this D over N ratio is your depleted versus non-depleted. So this is looking at the abundance of these proteins in your depleted serum versus your non-depleted serum. So if this D over N ratio is greater than one, that means that the protein has a higher abundance in your depleted serum versus a non-depleted serum. And that's what you don't want. So, um, so we um, pass the serum through this amino affinity depletion column once, and again, all of these proteins that are in this table should be depleted by this amino affinity depletion column. But we can see that um, with one round of depletion, this D over N ratio is still greater than one for many of these proteins. Um, so um, for this amino affinity depletion strategy, you can even do a second round of amino affinity depletion. So then after a second round of depletion, then these proteins that are outlined in red 
those um, those relative abundances do um, the deep to end ratio does go below one. But as you can see, there are still several proteins whose abundances remain, whose deep to end ratio remains greater than one even after two rounds of depletion. So this does speak to the um, the lack of the um, robustness and the performance of this amino affinity depletion column. So, um, so we said, okay, so let's just proceed to, um, to run our assay and see what happens if we um, run our assay using um, serum that has not been depleted versus serum that has depleted, been depleted once versus serum that has been depleted twice. So what you're looking at here are the limits of detection and limits of lower limits of quantification of 65 peptides in our assay. And there are three technical replicates. So this is looking at, so differences in the LOD versus the LOQ, um, again, of these 65 peptides um, following no depletion, one round of depletion or two rounds of depletion. So as you can see, we actually are getting improved limit, uh, limit of detection and lower limit of quantification for peptides that are quantified in the non-depleted serum compared to the serum that's been depleted um, using um, depleted once versus serum that's been depleted twice. So I think really this is um, this is um, kind of an indication of what we were saying in the previous slide, wherein even after one round or two rounds of immunofinity depletion, some of those um, highly abundant proteins are still present, and uh, we're seeing quite a bit more variability um, from samples that have undergone depletion versus those that have um, um, not undergone depletion. So we decided to proceed without depleting our um, samples. And um, also one of the drawbacks of conducting um, immuno affinity depletion is that in addition to depleting the proteins that you want to be depleted, there can kind of be your um, proteins that kind of go along for the ride with your depletion. So you might actually be getting rid of more proteins than you are intending to get rid of. So we proceeded without um, um, conducting depletion. And just a little bit of word here. So I talked about um, selection of your assay method and how to develop your method and what happens prior to the mass spectrometer. So prior to the mass spectrometer, um, we have our liquid chromatography system. There are several different modes of liquid chromatography that differ based on the flow rate. So you can talk about your nano flow rates. These are flow rates that are less than one microliter per, mil per minute. Capillary flow rates, one to 10 microliters per minute. Micro up to 200, even like 500 microliters per minute. And analytical flow rates, um, these are um, higher. So um, snapshot of all this, upshot of all of this is each one of these different methods has, again, strengths and weaknesses. These are indicated on the um, periphery of this radial diagram. So here are different parameters that one can analyze. So ionization efficiency, dead volume, peak width, sensitivity, throughput, spray stability, robustness. So whether you're choosing a nano flow, capillary flow, or micro analytical flow method, um, one would need to take into consideration how these methods perform with respect to these different parameters. And um, kind of taking a step back, um, just one little note about liquor chromatography applications. So um, back in the day, ages ago, uh, when I first started using um, mass spec-based proteomics, um, embarrassingly, <laughs> 20 years ago, um, um, most of the proteomic applications were focused on nano flow applications. So there's really this thought that you really need to have these really, really low flow rates in order for us to be able to quantify all these proteins. But really that has changed. I think we're really seeing a shift in the field in that now we're not, it's not as important to really conduct these large scale discovery um, um, experiments all the time. I think we're now seeing more so of a shift to more reproducible applications. Uh, we know what we're looking at. We just want to quantify these analytes reproducibly. So this is a very nice review uh, that was published last year where the authors have really um, shown um, the benefits of um, which type of liquid chromatography system works, works best for the different type of analytical samples that you want to, um, to look at. So um, they're recommending for body fluids, which we're looking at here, which I'm talking about for this project, so we can't see them. Um, they do recommend the use of microflow applications. And then, so that is what we have chosen to use for this study. So just for the sake of comparison, so we did do a comparison of our uh, targeted mass spec assay um, using a nanoflow liquid chromatography versus microflow liquid chromatography. No surprise, the limit of detection and lower limit of quantification is higher versus microflow uh, if for our microflow applications. But we decided to go with this application versus nanoflow 
for several of the reasons that are um, mentioned um, here. So the throughput is much higher. Stability is much higher. Robustness is much higher. Um, there is a bit of a sacrifice um, in terms of ionization efficiency and sensitivity, but we made a decision that the gains that we are getting, that we are obtaining for throughput and mainly robustness um, far outweigh um, the drawbacks, uh, what we're losing in terms of sensitivity. So um, how are these assays validated? So again, I talked about that on this three-tier strategy. So we are going for a tier two-based um, uh, validation. So according to the National Cancer Institute's um, Office of Cancer Clinical Proteomics Research and the Clinical Proteomics Tumor Analysis Consortium, or CPTEC, or um, NIH acronyms, um, they do have um, very specific requirements for these tier two assays. So there are two main experiments that need to be conducted. The first experiment is a response or a calibration or a standard curve. The goal here is to determine the relationship between instrument response and known concentrations of the peptide. And the second experiment is a mini validation of repeatability. Here, the goal is to, um, to determine the measurement precision under a set of repeatability conditions of uh, every measurement. So how do we select our um, biomarker candidates for this study? So several different considerations that, um, that we had in mind. So first of all, our biomarker candidates needed to have been observed by other mass spec studies in the past. Um, there are several available public mass spec data repositories. So um, it is very um, a good, it's, it's a good practice to make sure that if we have biomarker candidates and you want to develop a targeted mass spec assay that we should be able to find evidence that that protein or peptide from that proteins have actually been detected by mass spec uh, before. So we have, we did a lot of work um, kind of um, cross-checking our initial um, list of candidates that we derived from the literature with what has actually been um, observed in previous mass spec um, studies. Since we're looking at serum proteins, we wanted to make sure that the peptides we selected were from the cell, sur um, from cell surface proteins must be located within the extracellular region of that protein. Um, we made sure that our peptides of interest did not contain any reactive residues, so meaning that um, these are um, um, uh, amino acids that are that can readily um, undergo um, modification. Um, we want to make sure that these uh, peptides have unique peptide um, sequences. Um, and also there is an optimal hydropathy score for these peptides and also a, um, an optimal peptide length. So here, so I initially, I, I mentioned that there were 25 proteins, but after we did our full method um, validation, two of those proteins actually did not meet our criteria for acceptability. So two of the proteins were dropped from the panel that um, uh, left us with 23 proteins. And they're all um, listed here, including MUC16 or CA125. Of interest, these proteins do span six orders of magnitude. So from, um, from 0.0025 to 9,100 micrograms per liter. And these um, endogenous abundances are determined um, by, um, were uh, obtained from information that's uh, publicly available in this uh, protein atlas database. So circled here are basically the proteins that were identified and quantified um, uh, across um, all of our samples. So again, going back to the requirements for assay validation. So experiment number one is our response or our calibration curve. So here we need to look at our limit of detection, lower limit of quantification and linearity, just for the sake of, um, just for demonstration, here's our calibration curve for, um, for CA125 or MUX16. Again, we have 65 total peptides in our assay panel from um, ultimately finally a list of 23 proteins. Um, we have a nine point calibration curve. Um, just some of the technical information that's shown here. And then experiment number two, we're looking at the mini validation of repeatability. So three different concentrations. How do these uh, peptides um, perform across five different days against replicate injections, analyses within a day? Um, so again, this is um, kind of just a mini validation of repeatability to um, assess the uh, reproducibility of the performance of our assay. And this is um, just the results from this experiment number two. So 65 peptides, we assess repeatability across five days, three concentrations, low, medium, and high. And the majority of our peptides do indeed have a variability less than 20%, um, which was our cutoff for um, acceptability. And ultimately, finally, so deploying this assay to quantify um, endogenous levels of these um, serum uh, proteins. 
So what are we doing here? So we have um, serum that's obtained from a sample set that's comprised of healthy controls, uh, patients with benign ovarian disease, early stage high-grade serous ovarian cancer, and late stage high-grade serous ovarian cancer. And these um, samples were um, obtained from a biorepository that is uh, managed by, um, by Amy Skubitz. So how do we analyze these samples? So basically we have our patient serum matrix. Um, again, I mentioned that we are foregoing um, protein depletion. Uh, we're using a surfactant-aided uh, digestion. We're using microflow-based liquid chromatography. So into each sample, we're spiking in our heavy peptides that are serving as our internal standards. Again, so these are the four proteins that were reproducibly uh, quantified uh, across our um, samples. So we have insulin-like growth factor binding protein 2, osteopontin, sex binding hormone globulin, and uh, metal proteinase inhibitor 1. So just looking at the CVs of these proteins and to kind of orient you here, so um, these letters, so the first letters of number refer to the um, abbreviation for the protein. There's the underscore, and then the last three letters are the first three amino acids of the peptide that was used to measure these proteins. So um, here again, so the proteins and peptides, the number of samples in which they were quantified, the um, minimum and maximum CV across all 69 samples, and also the mean CV. So um, osteopontin, um, this uh, protein was actually dropped um, because of the wide range and variability, um, and also because it was only uh, quantified in a small subset of the samples. And the upshot of all of this. So what did we find? So basically, um, IBP2 and TEMP1 serum levels differentiate late-stage high-grade serous ovarian cancer versus early-stage benign and non-cancerous lesions. So these are the proteins that had um, so CV less than 20%. And again, here are the um, significance levels for these proteins. So here's IBP2 and also uh, TEMP1. So you can see that the levels of these proteins are significantly higher in the high-grade serous ovarian cancer samples versus early stage and benign and non-cancerous. So wrapping up here. So the next steps. So next steps, uh, we have our assay that's been validated, but we'd like to be able to quantify um, um, additional proteins. So with lower abundance. So I mentioned to do that, you can either take a depletion um, strategy or you can take an uh, adopt an enrichment strategy. So um, we'd like to incorporate a peptide-directed antibody-based enrichment method um, that will enable us to quantify lower abundance uh, endogenous proteins. And then this um, immunotargeted mass that can assay will need to be validated. We'd like to deploy this assay using a larger panel of ovarian cancer serum samples, um, again, um, obtained uh, through a very fruitful collaboration with, um, with Amy uh, Skubitz. And this will enable us to really establish a multi-protein classifier to differentiate stages of serous ovarian cancer. And we'd also like to continue um, to evaluate um, standardized and automated sample prep methods. So again, here are the objectives of the talk. So we talked about standardized assays and their need, talked about the role for various mass spec applications, and we've also talked about how to develop and validate these targeted mass spec assays. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, various funding sources. So um, from the CTSI here, um, an Early Career Research Award, um, also the Startup Funds and, and it, the Innovation Initiatives Award from um, our Laboratory Medicine and Pathology Department, um, also funding from the V Foundation for Cancer Research, um, a pilot project uh, that was funded through Mayo Clinic's Ovarian Score, and also the Minnesota Ovarian Cancer Alliance. And of course, none of this would have been possible without um, just amazing, amazing um, team, um, lab team members. So um, here's everybody in the lab, a previous member, and then also um, wonderful collaborators, um, Amy Skubitz, Kristen Boylan, um, Wei Hua uh, Guan, uh, Tim Starr, and Kathleen Boris Lowry. Um, here's our lab website, like more information. And so we have two minutes for questions. <laughs> yep. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, this is Bharat here. This is really nice talk. Um, I was just curious, um, you know, you had quantified 23 proteins, mm -hmm. um, but then you said only four proteins were detectable in all samples. How, yes. I mean, so the, um, I thought when you said the 23 proteins were quantified, they were quantified in serum and your tested endogenous levels. Or yeah, so yeah, sorry for the so not explaining that clearly. So for the assay validation, 
So that's um, the validation is conducted by um, using synthetic peptides. So we have synthetic unlabeled or light labeled for light peptides and also our heavy peptides that are formed um, that are as stable isotope labeled. So by enabling, by meaning that we're quantifying those 23 proteins, that means that we're able to quantify them using those synthetic um, peptides as um, internal standards and also the light forms of those peptides. So we're spiking them in at um, different concentrations in the background of serum matrix. But when we go to deploy that assay to measure those same analytes in serum, that's when uh, we're able to quantify the four proteins. So the 23 referred to quantifying those proteins from an assay validation standpoint. But then when you get to looking at them and endogenously, that's when you're dropping down to the floor. Okay. Okay. okay, thank you. We're going to end with that. Everybody knows how to get a hold of Stephanie if you don't give us a call. Um, and we'll go on to our QA meeting for the day. Thank you, Dr. Thomas.